or rather a very good afternoon to you at the moment and welcome to uh, this course on Robinson Crusoe that I'm coordinating for the department. Now, uh, one of the things I'd like to just add to for, for all of you is that this course has three basic parts. The first where I talk about default is life and times. And uh, the various kinds of narrative that were available to him. The second part discusses <coughs> the English tradesman, the complete English tradesman, which is also part of the CDCS course uh, in a lecture and talks about, you know, Defoe's preoccupation with this concept of money and trade. So that's the second part. Uh, I hope to cover these parts in two lectures and then proceed to uh, a discussion of Robinson Crusoe, its composition, uh, a detailed analysis of texts, and I'll be projecting the text and taking you through the different passages of Robinson Crusoe, pointing here and there the important strands within the text. And finally, uh, leading up to a more holistic discussion of the kinds of uh, <coughs> the kinds of uh, issues that Robinson Crusoe covers. So that then is fundamentally what I'm planning to do in this Robinson Crusoe course. And I will uh, sort of initiate this discussion by, uh, by starting off with uh, Defoe's uh, major idea of, uh, uh, of, or rather the major component of today's text, what was Defoe's life like? And uh, what uh, or how did this man come into being? And for this, I'd like to take the chronology uh, from uh, John Rickety's The Cambridge Companion to Defoe. And I am presently sharing my screen, uh, which gives you an idea of the chronology, really. Now, you will find that. Uh, the, the entire time period of D4 actually sort of covers uh, the 1660 to 1731. Uh, Fundamentally, the entire corpus of uh, the major 18th, initial 18th century, great uh, long 18th century concerns. <coughs> Defo is born on the stroke of uh, the restoration of monarchy. And uh, his father is a chandler, deals with leather, and his mother is a housewife. And as Defo is born, as it were, the monarchy is restored in England. Now, 1662, the Act of Uniformity is passed, whereby dissenters are tolerated and the defos, not really defos, they were known as the foes, they joined the dissenting church. And this was to be important for defo in the sense that the kind of oppression that the dissenters often faced, even if there was an Act of Uniformity, was to be a concern for his major treatise, the short way with dissenters. Now, interestingly, in 1665-66, when Defoe is just around a child, he witnesses the Great Plague of London. He does not actually witness the Defoe's plea and the Great Fire of London. <clears throat> now, interestingly, in 1720, he will revisit the plague in his uh, treatise or his fictional narrative of the Great Plague of London. Now, it's interesting in the way, you see, in which experience in default 
is as it were proverbially stored in his memory and in his journalistic imagination so that you know defoe's artistic creativity is engaged firmly with the here and the now the word that i often use for this is contemporaneity and a fervent desire for news now you will remember that as the 1660s dawn on england a whole set of new narrative forms are available to the writer especially in terms of prose so we have journalistic writing we have biographies autobiographies we have writings on trade we have writings which are pornographic we have writings which are dedicated to criminals therefore a whole set of new narratives are as it were born with defo and defo actually grows up in this kind of liminal area between fact and fiction where you know the the entire the entire breadth of his fiction combines these elements now of course uh 1671 to 79 defoe attends the school of reverend james fisher this is fundamentally a dissenting academy and therefore defoe's conditioning takes place here now, once again i would just like to quickly add to this you know ethic of capitalism and uh <clears throat> protestantism that was gradually entering into the european more importantly the english body fabric as it were why do i say this because you see this concern with the individual self and the advancement of the self through relentless self examination which was a protestant ethic was also being transferred into the economic sphere with this concept of a possessive individualism the term that james macpherson uses and therefore we have this kind of alliance between uh, the development of protestantism on the one hand and the rise of a kind of a capitalist ethic on the other of course 1600 has been the date when the east india company has been established so by 1660 it's uh, benefits are being reaped colonialism is gradually coming to a peak and you know floating projects sailing ships traveling to new lands is becoming one of the most important uh, ways of advancement defo is looking at all these and he's also looking at if you carefully sort of take a look at his biography he's also looking at the gradual urbanization of england in the way that england is becoming an urban center right and there is massive migration from the uh, from the cities uh, from the country to the city and also the massive growth of both an underworld as well as the growth of the merchant class and its replacement of the landed gentry something which you'll talk about also in the great english state straits now uh, in interestingly defo uh, by 1683 is established as a hosiery merchant and is lives near cornhill in the royal exchange so from his very young adulthood defo is interested in trading in commerce in trying to build up his own trade empire as it were and therefore he is continuously moving into new uh, areas of attempting to do new trades by 1683 he is quite established as a merchant but there is also this propensity of taking risks because and entering into new fanciful pro projects because of which he will very soon uh, <clears throat> enter into bankruptcy now 1684 is marrying mary tuffy with whom he will have eight children 
and receives a dowry of 3,700 pounds, which is a very substantial dowry at that point of time. So Defoe is set up in life. And in 1685, Defoe takes the uh, a kind of a the, the, the side of Manmat's rebellion, which we read about in uh, Absalom and Actifel. It's interesting in the sense that Defoe's trade and politics and journalism writing seems to always overlap into one another. Now, I think Defoe is one of the most incredible of British writers, not only because he wrote Robinson Crusoe, but by the time he had died, he had written 541 texts. And the sheer variety of these texts, from trade writing to editing a newspaper all through his life, from fictional accounts of plagues to fictional accounts of pickpockets and thieves to the great Robinson Crusoe, satires, you name it, Defoe writes it. Right. So here is a man who could very freely move across you know, trades, he could move across literary genres, and he could also move across politics. As you'll see, this is his first major foray into politics, as it were. Now, by the time we are witnessing Defoe in his 25th to 30th year, Defoe is a prosperous businessman who deals with hosiery, tobacco, wine, and other goods. And Defoe is quite widely traveled. You see, this propensity to travel across the continent is something, and, and this frequent movement from his home comfort zone, which later on, you know, Crusoe will call his original sin, is something that Defoe also sort of uh, kind of experienced. You'll see that there is continuously a tension within within Defoe's writings, this desire of a, of a solid middle class existence marked by trade, commerce and money versus a continuous throwing away of this kind of stability and stepping into the zone of speculative trade. It's something which Robinson Crusoe repeatedly does and something which Daniel Defoe always did. So, you know, crossing new frontiers, crossing into new genres is something that is intrinsic to both Robinson Crusoe and his creator, Daniel Defoe. Now, in 1688, of course, you know, the Glorious Revolution occurs and William of Orange takes up the throne. And by 1692, Defoe has already sunk into bankruptcy. It's almost 17,000 pounds in debt, debt, right? And it's 1695, actually. And we do not really know why Daniel Defoe, Daniel Foe becomes Daniel Defoe, right? Something we will talk about when we discuss at the end of the course, maybe uh, one of the major re-readings of the novel Foe by James Cutsier. Now, 1697 is very interesting because Defoe is writing an essay on projects. Now, this is what we will call an economic treatise because Defoe is writing out plans or possible potential plans for increase of trade for people all around. Right. So uh, this is the publication of the, an essay on projects. And you can see the economic motive that runs through Defoe's writings right through his uh, writings. Now, uh, 1697 to 1701, Defoe acts as an agent or a secret agent for William III in England and Scotland. Now, you will remember that this is the time when the Scottish uh, act of union with the with England is on the horizon. So Defoe is repeatedly traveling across England and Scotland on this mission, acting on behalf of the state. Now, 
1701, he's writing The True Born Englishman, who is a poetic satire of English xenophobia and the defense of William III, who, William of Orange, who's actually Dutch. Now, the prefix D is often associated with Dutch prefixes. So, you know, at this point of time, this change of identity might have had uh, something to do with the reference to his allegiance to the king. But in 1702, William dies and Queen Anne comes to uh, the throne. And this is where, you see, England quickly moves into a very harsh mode with dissenters. And Defoe is extremely disturbed in the sense that their sect, as it were, in Christianity comes into attack. So he moves into satiric mode and writes the shortest way with dissenters which is, you know, in direct conflict with the Church of England and also a slight against the Queen. So the man who is acting as the agent of the state suddenly finds himself on the wrong side of the state. But one of the things to notice is the Defoe's writings is marked continuously by a questioning of uh, both religion and uh, domination of the state. So these are aspects which will work its way into Robinson Crusoe. What is the state going to be like? What is the king going to be like? And what is religion going to be like? These are issues that, you know, uh, sort of Defo problematizes in his texts. And 1703, very interestingly, Defo is actually imprisoned, taken to Newgate prison for writing the shortest way of, with, dis, uh, with dissenters, is taken to the pillory. And the pillory is where, of course, in the marketplace, you are almost tied in stocks and people can throw things at you at random. So the pillory is a very risky place to be in and you are publicly humiliated. The default turns all of this around with a very interesting text called <coughs> the hymn to the pillory where he sort of kind of glorifies people on the pillory and attacks the state once again and instead of tomatoes and eggs and stones apparently flowers are thrown at him although the this might have been rather you know exaggerated an account but very interestingly is the first and the only political uh, and literary personality to have withstood the shame of pil the pillory and risen to prominence. Now, 1704, Defoe is released from jail. He had been thrown into jail for both uh, dissent as well as poverty. And he is asked to work in favor of the government and write for the government. So he starts writing uh, the review. Now, this is a periodical that is a landmark in the history of, of English non-fictional writing. Even though we've studied The Spectator and sundry other texts, this becomes very crucial because Defoe provides very significant journalistic insights into the political landscape of England. And he's also making these political commentaries with great incisive, incisive power. So political journalism as a form sort of is initiated really with Defoe's periodical The Review. 1704 to 13, once again, Defoe is asked to work for the state, for the government. And he travels extensively to London, uh, to Edinburgh, to Scotland in disguise, not in disguise really, but in, uh, he pretends to be sympathetic to the Scots. But in reality, he is arguing for the act of the union and plays a major part in it. It's a considerable risk because if his identity had been revealed, Defoe would have been torn to bits. Now, 1707, of course, you have the Union of England and Scotland. And 
1713, Defoe is again arrested for debt and is repeatedly thrown into prison. You know, it seems that he comes out of one debt and falls into another debt. So this is a period, a very dark period of Defoe's uh, career. But remember something, that in jail or in prison, he gets to know the prison system. He gets to know the prisoners, the pickpockets, the thieves, pirates, and so on and so forth. And these he works repeatedly into his novels. For example, of course, Moll Flanders, Captain Singleton, all of these texts, you know, become replete with Defoe's actual experiences in prison. So remember that word, contemporaneity. Defoe's texts are rooted within the bedrock of journalism. In the sense that he notes com contemporary affairs, writes about them, two accounts, and then weaves fictions around them also. So his experience in prison in 1713 and 1714, and then he's a valuable agent for the government. So once again, released by the government. Now, 1714 is when Queen Anne dies and George I comes to power and 1715 onwards, Defoe starts writing another form of genre, another genre, another prose form, which is the conduct manual, right? And therefore, this is the family instructor. And once again, you have this idea about the Protestant family led by the patriarch, inculcating values of positive individualism, the family as the unit of modern society ties up nicely with the idea of, you know, the kind of companionate marriage that Lawrence Stone will talk about later on. Now, 1719, you see, this period between 1718 to 1724 is probably the most fertile of Defoe's periods. And therefore, 1719, of course, we come to our Ur text, Robinson Crusoe. Now, and of course, he follows it up with a sequel, The Further Adventures of Robinson Crusoe. And Robinson Crusoe catapults Defoe into prominence. It sells huge numbers, in huge numbers. And Defoe, at this point of time, is, you know, moving back and forth between journalism, the writing the novel. Of course, he's not conscious that he's writing a novel as such. It turns it a true history of Robinson Crusoe. And we'll come to that, that by the by. By this time, Defoe is also writing another form of literature, which will <coughs> come within the purview of Robinson Crusoe, is the Protestant autobiography. You see, the Protestant autobiography persistently takes a look at individual daily experience recording a journal, as it were, of the experiences and tries to trace the ways <coughs> in which, you know, the Christian will or the Christian God operates within human life. So individual experience is read against divine patterns, right? Now, one of the ways in which we'll read Robinson Crusoe and we'll see how dense the religious content is. And this is why I say that, you know, Defoe sort of combines this journal, combines the Protestant autobiography with the concept of the novel and journalism. So it's very interesting in the ways in which Defoe is continuously experimenting with forms of writings available to him. And he's trying to sort of merge them continually to provide new forms. So Defoe is, at root, a very experimental writer, just as in the way he experiments with trade, with disastrous consequences, he experiments with prose with very profitable consequences. In 1720, of course, you have Captain Singleton, and you have serious reflections on Robinson Crusoe. 
Now, that is the second sequel, but by this time, uh, it's dated a bit. 1721, Defoe is sort of once again looking at the prison system. And 1722 comes three texts all together. Mall Flanders, which talks about, you know, a whore and a thief and the prison system and the system of the of the plantations and you have Cornell Jack which once again talks about piracy talks about prison which talks about the penal system so we have Defoe looking taking a very close look at the penal and the uh, legal system of England at this point of time now this is going to be an abiding concern by the way in uh, 18th century novelistic writing you will have fielding writing about it you will have smollett writing about it leading up to the reform of the penal act and the formation of the concept of the penitentiary rather than the jail now the most powerful passages in mall flanders of course are about newgate uh, vision of hell itself as defoe writes an emblem of hell itself rather and Defoe's sharp critique about the penal system, which transforms the innocent uh, sort of victim of a crime into a hardened criminal, is something that Defoe will harp upon. 1722 is also the date of that very, very puzzling hybrid work. Now, in 1720, of course, the plague had broken out in Holland. And there was a fear that it would come back to England. The Defoe revisits the Great Plague of London of the 1660s. And in the guise of an unnamed narrator, revisits the intensity and the vividness of the plague, for which he falls back, up, back upon several journalistic writings. Now, what is this? This is a fiction of an event in 1666, written in 1722, but posing to be a direct record of 1666. So, Defoe is playing around with History is playing around with news and he's forever, you know, peddling, as it were, print and issues of contemporary interest to the people at large who are his consuming public. Now, this idea of consume print, the print is something to be consumed, news is something to be sold. And through news, you know, public opinion can be molded. It's something that Defoe brings to print culture of the 18th century. Now, the, the Journal of the Plague Year is a very, very strange operation of, you know, profitable print culture. Because you have the threat of a plague, you create an account of an earlier plague and sell it to the public, right? Where actually fiction poses as news. And in these, all these, you know, texts that we talk about, the novelistic texts, this boundary between fact and fiction, news and novel, is continuously blurring and being pushed by default to its maximum straining point, as it were. Of course, you know, there's nothing called the novel at this point of time. So it's all a very fuzzy boundary between news and fiction. Now, 1724 is, of course, Defoe's uh, last major novel, as it were, Roxana. And notice once again, he's writing a general history of pirates. So his interest in criminality in different kinds of uh, piracy 
especially high sea piracy becomes very important because high sea piracy was once again a great threat to uh, the trading and the commerce of England. And he also writes tour through the whole island of Great Britain, which is based on his, you know, experiences in England and Scotland. And therefore, Defoe is also experimenting with the format of the travel writing, which is already grafted somewhat into uh, Robinson Crusoe. So again, pushing the boundaries of prose uh, literature. Now, 1725 comes the complete English tradesman volume one and this is what I'll call economic writing now why is England a trading nation what are the benefits of trade how can trade be sort of uh, improved is writing D4 is writing an economic treatise with narrative embellishments added so that he's talking about particular cases, he's talking about individuals, so that economic writing becomes a kind of a narrative in itself. So once again, Defoe is reinventing or let me say inventing a new form of prose writing. And this is a text which will demand our considerable attention in the sense that Defoe will equate trading with England. So the body of England and the body of the tradesman will be superimposed upon one another. And then will come, or rather already has come Robinson Crusoe, who's sort of brought this merchant ethic into the novelistic form as it were. So it's interesting to see how Defoe can be read, or Robinson Crusoe can be read in terms of this uh, treatise of the complete English tradesman. In 1726, he will write the political history of the devil. Once again, you can see him shifting towards religion. 1727, he'll write conjugal lewdness, uh, history and reality of apparitions where he'll ruthlessly attack religious superstition and belief, and he will sort of argue very carefully about rationality. He'll write a new family instructor taking forward his experiments with uh, the genre of the conduct book. And he will expand on the complete English tradesman. 1724 comes Augusta Triumphanus, Triumphants rather, sorry, a plan of English commerce. So you see, Defoe is probably one of the first authors to identify the English post-colonial identity as essentially one of trading merchandise money. And he witnesses the decline of the landed gentry, the rise of the merchant as a hero, and the ethic of capitalism as the dominant ethic, which subsumes within itself the ethic of post, uh, the ethic of Protestantism. So Defoe, when he, or rather Crusoe, when he meets Friday on the island, is already planning that he needs helping hands to take his empire forward. He needs helping hands to talk to someone, be in dialogue with someone, explain the Christian precepts, and you know, create a way through which the island yield will multiply into surplus. Now, many of you will immediately argue that, you know, the island is a closed economy. But the way in which Defoe's aim is perpetually to engage both human beings and animals within the service of this barren territory which will become his island to create possibilities of surplus is fundamentally a rewriting of the English tradesman and the English trading commercial identity into fiction itself. And therefore Robinson Crusoe 
is not just only every man, it's also a very strong proponent of English colonialism as a form. Now, 1731, Defoe, who's taken up once again with debt, repeated debt, dies out of a stroke in London, hiding from creditors. Now, we've had a glimpse into this amazing personality of this, of this individual uh, who is, as it were, you know, a compendium of what this entire period of the 18th century was. He was an experimentalist in terms of trade, believed in the trading ethic of England and the improvement of the nation through trade, and was not afraid to take risks to plunge into new ventures, write about them, and proudly proclaim the identity of the British as a trading nation. It's also a very strong proponent of free trade, something which we'll find resonating later on in Adam Smith's treatise. So, you know, while we consider Adam Smith as one of the first great economists, writers, and thinkers of England, if you take a look at Defoe independently, leaving aside his Robinson Crusoe and his identity as a novelist, I think you'll find that Defoe is no less a writer in terms of economic treatises. Now, there is one particular episode, of course, where he talks about division of labor and the creation of a small pin. And the way in which he describes the numerous hands which go into the making of this small pin is a fabulous kind of uh, explanation of how trade and commerce and production operates. Now, this identity of Defoe as an English tradesman, experimentalist, venturist, capitalist, is reflected in Defoe the literature, who is once again continuously experimenting with all possible prose genres. He is taking up all the available prose genres of the period, trying to coach his people into projects, trading, family issues, and so on and so forth, and very often rewriting these concerns into his novels. At the same time, he's a political activist, often a secret agent for the government. It's very interesting in the way this identity of the secret agent, a different self, a concealed self that you have in the author. So two selves, one the Defoe and the other the secret agent, which overlaps with his fictional writing. So in Robinson Crusoe, for example, he's both Daniel Defoe, the author, and Robinson Crusoe, the narrator. In Mal Flanders, he's both Daniel Defoe, the male author, and Mal Flanders, the female protagonist who's writing in the first person voice. And that's very important to understand. You know, Defoe's very strong subjective presence in the first person mode of narration. Defoe is very careful and very insistent on creating authenticity in his narratives. The journalistic authenticity that he sort of brings forth from uh, the review, from his years at the review. So journalism, fiction, projection, trade writing, conduct books, satire. Once again, this is a man who moves freely across prose forms. But the one thing that sort of dominates his literary writings is his commitment to contemporary. Defoe is not going to write about myth. 
is not going to be writing about you know classical parallels and therein lies his difference with fielding you know fielding will be bringing in contemporary but he will be trying to relate his narrative to classical parallels for default his writing is immersed in the here and the now even his allegorical island is a potential island drawn from the news and you can refer to alexander selkirk who was featuring in the news at that point of time so defo is immersing his subject his novelistic subject within the contemporary discourse of news and trying to find out his writings are all about this as to how this new colonial trading english self comes into adjustment with the changes in society it is therefore that i would like to argue that daniel defo the man and the author is not only a product of his times but also one of the most sharpest one of the sharpest observers of his period dissecting it looking at the ways in which trade commerce protestantism protestantism is transforming the political the social the religious and the domestic landscape of 18th century england you know far before uh, i'm sorry feeling might be the more consummate artist swift might be the more consummate satirist stern might be far more complex with narrative but for defo remains the most comprehensive analyst and reporter of his times it is here you see that the man is life and his times continuously engage with each other you cannot separate defo's writings from contemporary history right it is that with that that i'd like to draw this lecture to an end in our next presentation which sometime tomorrow we'll take a look at his text which is by the way included in the non detailed section of your cbcs syllabus the complete english tradesman we'll be taking extracts short extracts from it and we'll take a look at how defo sees trade in england as intrinsically related and what the effects of trade on england are the social and political that he analyzes so tomorrow we take a look at the complete english tradesman following which we shall take very close looks at defo's robinson crusoe i thank all of you who have joined this live stream and i look forward to having you with me again sometime tomorrow which i'll duly post on facebook of course and also you can check this page for updates Thank you very much.